Welcome to the Betty Rocker Show, the place to be to nourish your mind, love your body, and rock your life. What's up, rock stars? Coach Betty Rocker here, and so excited to talk today with Dr. Uma Naidu about two of my favorite topics, nutrition and mental health. What is the connection between what we eat and how we feel? Dr. Naidu is here to talk about that. She is a Harvard-trained nutritional psychiatrist, a professional chef, and nutritional biologist. She is the founder and director of nutritional and metabolic psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital. She serves on the faculty at Harvard Medical School, and she designed and released the first and only continuing medical education program to educate other clinicians about nutrition and brain health. And she's the author of the national and international best-selling book, This Is Your Brain on Food, which has been published in 22 countries and 18 languages. I have it in my own library, and I hope after listening to today's conversation, you'll pick up a copy for yourself too. Join me in welcoming Dr. Uma Naidu to the show. Welcome to the show, Dr. Naidu. Great to have you with us. And thanks so much, Bri. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Same here. I mean, it's not every day that I get to talk to someone who is both a professional chef and a psychiatrist. What an amazing combination of skills you have. And you have so many skills, but that <laughs> pairing is especially cool to me. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's about, I think, following things I love to do and both fitted into that. So... And then my, my other part of my life is really focusing on nutrition. So, Yes. And, and that aspect is, you know, what the form, the framework of this incredible book that, that you wrote, this is your brain on food. And Thank I remember you. when I was reading this book, I was, you know, I keep that as a reference because you have, not only do you explain so much of the connection that food has and how we actually feel but you also have these wonderful uh, guides that I reference all the time, like, oh, what has magnesium in it? What food has this vitamin in it? You've got all of that <laughs> quick reference as well, which is so, so lovely. Um, I I have so many questions for you, but I, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about why is it that this is so new? Why is this a field that hasn't been explored before why why did why do conventional why does conventional medicine not pay attention to or care about nutrition as much as you do it's it's a great question you know for one thing doctors really don't learn nutrition in medical school about one fifth of medical schools in the united states even now teach nutrition and on my advocacy side of my life i'm i'm certainly working to improve that but it's not a natural fit for doctors to talk about nutrition because they don't study it. I just came from, from a very food forward family, but culturally rich, you know, enjoyed eating, enjoyed food, a sense of family, but also a sense of science. And what I found was that I went, you know, was medical school and studying. I just found there was a gap. There was just this gap in conversation. And in residency, that gap, you know, I was prescribing medications every single day and being taught to prescribe medications that had side effects. And although we were taught the side effects, we were not taught any lifestyle questions or suggestions as to, besides checking someone's weight and asking cursorily, you know, hope you're eating healthy, nothing more was being done. And I just thought that that was such a gap. And early on, a patient really had an, uh, had a, you know, got upset with me. And while his his concern technically wasn't valid because I had not caused the weight gain from the medication I prescribed, it was too soon and I had all the data in front of me. I was able to talk to him about what he was drinking because he came in with a massive cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee. And I, in, in part to change the conversation, said to him, well, why don't you just tell me what you put in your coffee today? Let's start there because you're concerned about your weight. And when we figured out together that he'd put more than a quarter cup of highly processed creamer, 
uh, with colorants, dyes, food stabilizers, and then eight teaspoons of sugar before he ate breakfast. Um, he was able to understand the number of empty calories he was consuming every single day. And for me, that was a very powerful moment because for one, it completely changed his mannerism from gruff and upset with me to understanding and engaged and wow, now I can do something and you've taught me something and, you know, tell me how to make my coffee healthier. What can I, what can I do? You know, and it really led to a long therapeutic relationship. We didn't have to increase his selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. We kept it there, but we really worked on lifestyle changes. And for me, it just proved the point, something I didn't know. Maybe I knew it intuitively, but I didn't know that. Um, it could be so powerful. And really, my interest was sparked from there with my cultural background, and it grew from there. Um, and then the ongoing uh, research around the gut-brain connection, and that even though, you know, Hippocrates had nodded to this eons ago, you know, the father of modern all allopathic medicine, the truth is the research had to catch up. And that is only in the last decade and a half. So, you know, I like to say that the gut-brain connection explains the food-mood connection. So that's the other piece that kind of came together as we started to understand more. Most people, to your point, you know, think about how they eat in terms of diabetes, type 2 diabetes or hypertension or their waistline. They don't think about it in terms of their mental health. And that really was a very gaping gap that I felt needed to be filled. Just in that example with that client who you were trying to help, I mean, that's such a beautiful story too, because it was, you were getting this like pushback from him, right? Like he wanted to blame <laughs> you for the medication and saying, that's what caused my weight gain. Okay. And yet, and, and you were like, let me help this person. Let's, let's change it. You were thinking about him in a mental health perspective, as well as a physical health perspective in that moment, you were hold, creating a, a container for him to have that anger and those feelings and, and, and also yeah. to say, okay, how can I shift that conversation with, with this person? Because it's not necessarily your, it's not your, it's, I feel like people feel like it's their fault all the time, or they, they need to blame yeah. you, the doctor, or they need to blame themselves. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. we can kind of look more at science and nature and say, okay, what, what are these foods actually, what do they contain? Because you've said this before, I've, I've watched a ton of your videos and, and listened to you a lot online. And one of the things that I love is this thing that, you know, food is a human universal. We all eat, mm. we're all connected in this way, right? Everybody right. eats. And so that means that there has to be something that we're communicating to our bodies by what we're eating, because we're all having mm -hmm. sort of a different experience based on many factors, but food being a yeah. big part of that. Yes. So that's, you know, when you start talking about the gut brain connection and the, the, the food mood connection, this yeah. is something that I think no one ever really put together quite the way that you did. And I, I, I love the story of, you know, you just how you care about people and in your background of food and your cultural background, how you blend it all of that. Like, this is what we need. This is what is needed. We talked to us a little bit more about those things that we eat that can affect our mental state. Yeah. Well, and thank you for saying what you just did, because that's, it's kind of, I feel like, you know, people talk about a secret sauce. I feel like it's the recipe I developed without knowing that it would end up being this, this maybe this helpful for people. So I appreciate hearing that. Um, I also like the question that you asked me because I'll tell you, people always say, well, what, what should I eat? And I often will say back to them, it's often I start with what you should cut back on because with the standard American diet, it's called sad for a reason. Many of us are just consuming a lot of stuff we don't, like my, my patient bought, you know, consuming stuff we don't even realize is causing us to impact impact our mental health. And some of these foods, to be honest, may also be affecting your weight and your type 2 diabetes or your, or your, your glucose intolerance or your insulin resistance. But it's often the processed, ultra-processed foods that have a ton of um, tolerance, you know, um, food stabilizers, thickeners. There was a study done in 2022, and it was an animal study, but I, I feel it was significant because it looked at the effect of a thickener that's used in foods called carboxymethylcellulose. Um, and 
they, it had a negative impact on the microbiome of rats in that in the microbiome, um, they produced fewer of the good substances we need in our gut, which are the short chain fatty acids. And it actually proved that. So it's a good, it's helpful for us to know, even though we need to find those studies and, and do them in humans, um, that these, these substances do affect our gut. They have this direct impact. And by affecting our gut, it is definitely affecting our brain because we know there's that gut brain connection. So those those processed ultra processed foods, the sort of junk foods, fast foods, added sugars, high fructose corn syrup, none of those are good for our brain. Um, and when you're eating fast foods, you may not realize it, but they're often fried in unhealthy fats because they uh, processed vegetable and seed oils are less expensive. So you're actually eating pro-inflammatory foods when you eat that. And then, you know, um, things like artificial sweeteners, uh, I know that it's hard for people to not have some of them. Just don't lean on that diet soda. Don't have that all the time. Don't only eat things with artificial sweeteners, you know, rather maybe try to get your palate juice to a few more berries or fruit because that's a natural form of sugar. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's these, um, it's, it's these added salts and foods. It's these added sugars. It's the processed vegetable oils, the artificial sweeteners that are really kind of working against our mental health. And, one of the things that people don't realize, for example, is preserved and uh, uh, certain types of processed meats, for example. If you do consume meats, some of the processed meats actually contain nitrites. And those these nitrates actually affect our mood. So little, I, I don't know if you've ever seen this recently in supermarkets, you'll actually see nitrate-free uh, bacon or nitrate-free uh, meats, processed meats. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, I, I think that, those may be a slightly better version, but they are still uh, they are still what they are. So having these little uh, this information and the way I I sort of outline it, and this is your brain on food is foods to eat um, and foods to sort of limit or avoid. So foods to embrace and foods to limit, limit or avoid, and that that way you can balance it up as you move through the book, but also as you move through the, the supermarket. It's meant to be helpful to people uh, to navigate their mental well being. And you were talking about the bacteria in the gut. And I always think about these bacteria, they're living organisms. And they're, I always like to personify my cells. I like to personify my, my bacteria because it makes me like want to befriend and take care of them. And so yes. if I think about the gut bacteria, basically in the gut, whatever I'm choosing to intake and eat is impacting the way that they're able to do their job. And then they like use their little megaphone and they say, Hey, they talk to my brain and they, the brain then <laughs> has to respond, but the, they, yes. they can only communicate based on what I've fed them. Right. So like what we feed the gut bacteria is exactly right. what inf impacts the nuance that we signals that we send to the brain, which is That's what correct. you get at with why we want to limit or avoid certain types of these highly processed foods, because they really screw up that connection. And you see a lot of people with a lot of anxiety, a lot of um, brain fog, maybe they're struggling with their libido. And we know that there can be many different reasons for these things. But mm -hmm. since food is the thing that we eat multiple times a day, why not have as much control over that, that energy output and your moods as you can by choosing the foods that you eat more intentionally. And I think that's so important. Like, am I, am I right about that? How they communicate the, the, the you, you're, the yes. And I love that you said that because I have a base when I give lectures, I speak even to clients. So I'll talk about nurturing our gut microbes, nurturing them because they're part of you, right? It's like mm -hmm. having, having guests over to stay over or to have dinner with you. Generally, if you also, if you want them to be there, you're a hospitable person. You know, you'll yeah. try to prepare them a nice meal. Or if they're staying over, you'll make sure there's clean linen in their beds. You'll take care of them. And in a similar way, these microbes, there are trillions of them. And if you put them under a microscope, they would be probably the size of a medium avocado. So they're really tiny. And they, they live all over the uh, 
the, the you know the gut and the idea is if you feed them what they need they will act for you because there are tons of things that they do. They're involved in sleep and circadian rhythm, which is our internal body clock, vitamin production, hormone production, immunity, um, our mental health, and many, many more things. So if, if they're not nurtured and fed the right types of food, they can't function. But if you, and if you don't take care of them, here's the thing, if you're feeding them those added sugared foods and the the uh, processed, ultra-processed foods, there are also some bad players down there. The bad microbes will be fed. When they're fed and they take over, it upsets the balance of the gut. And that's, when it, that's what leads to inflammation over time and conditions like leaky gut because the breakdown products of those foods are toxic. And the toxic breakdown products damage the cell lining, the single cell lining of the gut. And that's where you really need to inflammation, leaky gut, and ultimately this feeds back in a loop to the brain. Um, so gut inflammation over time can become brain or neuroinflammation. And the cycle continues. So, you know, we have to think carefully about the choices we make. The time that you and I are recording this is the month of May and May is M mental health awareness month, which I love. Yes. And, and no matter when you guys are listening to this episode, it's always a good time to pay attention to and take care of your mental health. And so I love that this, um, this book and your work is so connected to supporting mental health, to, to helping us have equilibrium to having a good, yeah. we don't, we don't have to be in a good mood all the time, right? Like it's, it's no, natural no, we don't. to have, it, to have no. like these to have different a fluctuation. Moods. Yeah. Yeah. yeah to this, have a fluctuation. Is, this is life. Yeah. But to unintentionally create stress and to contribute to uh, bad feelings and, and negative thoughts in your brain, because you're inadvertently eating certain foods, that's mm -hmm. what we want to, I think, avoid. Right. And that's exactly right. It, it's not about, a, a. there isn't a perfect state of mind, there isn't a perfect food, there isn't a perfect diet, but what can we do? We can feel better than we may be feeling. We can feel better on more days than not. Um, will it change the fact that you're upset after an argument? No, but could you feel more relaxed? Could your mood be brighter? Could you feel less brain fog? Maybe you have been a problem focused right now. Food can impact that. It's not the only thing, but it's one of the factors that most people are overlooking and it's, it's right within their reach. What is, um, for example, what are some of the key foods that you would recommend if someone was struggling to, with their memory, like if they were having trouble, you know, I don't know, remembering things. Yeah. So, so, you know, the, we always start with where do we clean, what do we clean up, what do we cut back on, what do we, what do we kind of limit or start to really remove if possible. Um, some of the things are foods like olive oil. Um, olive oil is actually protective because it has healthy fats. There are herbs and spices like turmeric with a pinch of black pepper. The black pepper and turmeric actually helps to activate the turmeric and the curcumin and turmeric can make it about 2000% more bioavailable to the brain and body, making meaning it gets absorbed and can be more active. Um, spices like cinnamon, and by the way, cinnamon is great if you want a sweet taste without sugar. Um, saffron, rosemary, ginger, and sage are some spices you could be adding to your food. Uh, believe it or not, coffee is thought to be beneficial with memory, but it's usually about un under. 400 milligrams. So not a ton of it. If you do drink caffeine, have it, uh, um, you know, have it in, in limited quantities, but it may potentially be helpful. And interestingly, the, um, the, there's a antioxidant called luteolin, which is found in foods like fresh peppermint, sage thyme, hot peppers, sweet peppers, radicchio, celery seeds, parsley, and a few others. And these actually help to lift brain fog. So if you, you know, thinking that that could be helpful, there are foods you can add in for that reason as well. I feel like a lot of these must have overlap, right? Because sometimes when you're struggling to remember things, you're also dealing with some brain fog or you're having trouble focusing as well on your work. 
and mm -hmm. um, that those those kind of could all, I guess, overlap in different ways. Um, usually someone doesn't just like the only thing I have is memory struggling with that. Right? It's usually like a Correct. combination or and, a cluster of things. And then I'm so glad you said that because, you know, the, the classification that mental health clinicians and certainly psychiatry uses is the DSM-5 TR, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And the truth is that people just, you know, a system needed to be created. I agree with that. But people just don't fall into checklists. Yeah. Um, people may have problems with brain fog and focus, problems with trauma and sleep, problems with depression and anxiety. So it's often a combination of many different symptoms. And I think that's another reason that food can be powerful. Rather than thinking of the checklist or thinking about a medication first, but medications are unnecessary for some people. So I'm not against them. They've saved the lives of many of my patients, but there are also these other things we can be doing. Uh, we can be eating differently. We can be spending time outdoors. Um, you know, even 10 minutes of daylight makes a difference to mood and anxiety because of, uh, because of our vitamin D. So there are many, many things we can be doing. And I feel the focus is generally, um, a little bit too much just in medication and not thinking about it in an integrated approach. Right. And that's what I was getting at there with the, the integration and that there are many layers and nuances to treating a human being because humans are so, we are complex. We have many systems yeah. in our bodies and our minds. And um, we, we feel things from so many different, so many different things can impact our mood, our, our, our childhood history or what mm -hmm. happened yesterday. Like there's mm -hmm. so much that, you know, and, and learning to both, you know, learning tools for mental strength and self-awareness and many of the things that as a psychiatrist, I'm sure you've, you've helped people with. Um, mm -hmm. And then this kind of combination of how can we also like this, like we were talking about before this universal of we, what we eat every day can also yes. help bridge that gap can help us get, go that extra mile. And, um, it's, it's just so, and what, what is, what is nutritional psychology exactly in a nutshell? Can you tell us about this? Cause this is a nascent field, isn't it? Yes. So nutritional psychiatry is the use of healthy whole foods and nutrients, um, to improve your mental well being And it is particularly important to understand that this works in conjunction any type of therapy that you may be attending or, or doing and working on the, working with a therapist um, or medications that you may be being prescribed. So it's really meant to be this integrated approach. But a part of it is is very powerful because you know we do eat several meals a day. And food is something that is part of our daily lives. It's not a it's not a choice. Um, and therefore uh, well, actually, it can be a choice, and there are people who do struggle with eating. But this, it, it's meant to be something that you, is easy for us to do. Um, it's it's a low hanging fruit. It's if you're having meals several times a day, my perspective is why not just try to tweak every single meal in one healthy direction. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. You know, it can be. Um, if, if your thing is like a salty, crunchy snack and you have to get potato chips every afternoon. And, and, and this is the stuff I hear, you know, uh, this is what I've heard during COVID. And I think some of it actually has lasted. Uh, you can make healthy, you know, kale chips in the oven, oven roasted, a little bit of avocado oil and the spices of your choice and have a nice crunchy snack. You know, if you, if your thing became ice cream during the pandemic, there's a way to make in the recipe section of this is your brain on food. I have a recipe made uh, for ice cream with bananas and you can even make it in a chocolate flavor and the cacao flavonols are good for your brain. So, you know, there are ways to win and there are ways that food can be your winning strategy. You just have to pay attention to it and plan a little bit because it doesn't, you know, bananas don't end up in your home without some planning. Neither does the, the, the kale for kale chips or the baby spinach for baby spinach chips. So you've got to plan a little bit on that. You have some great videos on social media of you walking around in the grocery store talking about the importance <laughs> of reading food labels. 
And uh, we were you were talking about your banana. You, you probably have a banana nice cream. We call it a nice yes. cream. Yes, yes. Yeah, I love that. I love that recipe. Um, and what we do is we actually blend a serving of my organic protein powder in with it because oh. we were talking earlier about some of the coagulants that and the studies that we yeah. run on mm. animals. And when mm. I was formulating my protein powder, which is a completely custom formula, um, we, we tell Amazing. people like, Hey, when you, when you shake up our, if you just shake up our formula in water, it's going to settle after several minutes because we didn't put in all this, these additives That's to, right. yeah. to make it sticky. Like if you blend it in a smoothie, you'll never notice that it's just, if you're mm. just putting it in water and, 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 and if you're not reading your food labels and you're not paying attention on, on what you're buying, like you talk about in your grocery store videos, you might totally miss that this is something that's going to talk to your gut bacteria and, and your gut you over, you, you know, just, if you have it just a couple times a week, you might not even notice anything, Right. but it's this kind of compounding effect where we're eating all of these things without realizing mm -hmm. it. And then mm -hmm. our body just starts to talk back and that we just don't feel as good. And we don't know why, because mm -hmm. we're thinking, Oh, I'm eating a protein powder. So I must be healthy, but we're not paying right. attention to all of the ingredients in the protein, Correct. right? And I'm, and I'm sort of glad you said that because uh, whether it's uh, a protein powder, whether it's a protein bar, whether it's a something else, the reality is that these um, food labels are hugely important because there are many ingredients like the one that the study was done on, carboxy, carboxymethyl cellulose, it's a bit of a mouth, a bit of a, tongue twister, but important to understand that it's a thickener. And you're absolutely right, because many people will come in eating a protein bar, um, saying I'm having this great, great smoothie. And I'll, first thing I'll say to them, is it a clean protein powder? Yeah. And, you know, often it has other, other not so healthy ingredients. Mm -hmm. I also want to go back to the, the point about processed foods, because early on, and we were talking about it. And I just wanted to say that one of the things we don't realize from food manufacturers is that the um, they create foods. Like fast food restaurants spend a ton of money in research and development to, cr to create cr foods that we crave. These foods are called hyperpalatable in scientific research. And what that is, is we eat them and we want more of them. And so it sets up the cycle of craving and craving them. Have you ever gone to a fast food restaurant and ordered the French fries and said, oh, you know, I'll get the, I'll, I'll, I'll upsize that. And then what happens is you upsize it and you, you finish the whole thing. You, you were thinking, oh, I'll get a size small. So this, you know, I think we, we have to understand that the, the food industry and many aspects of things like food labeling are not necessarily working for the benefit of the customer. And we've got to be more savvy. Um, we've got to be more savvy about what we read. Um, another, another great example is something like a fruited yogurt. Now, whether you eat dairy or non-dairy yogurt, if it's fruited, people know blueberries are healthy or they've heard that. But a fruited blueberry yogurt, a half a cup can have eight teaspoons, six to eight teaspoons of added sugar. And you wouldn't add that if you were having a half cup of yogurt, you know. So think about it that way. And I, I think just one of the reasons... <laughs> I walked around the supermarket and I just want people to know some basic things. You know, I, I don't want it to feel like it has to be rocket science. These are things all of us have access to. If we just know a little bit, of, spend a bit of time choosing those groceries, um, reading the food labels and things like that, it's accessible to people. You said this in a really nice way, but it's almost like the, you talk about how the food companies are researching ways to get us to eat the product, but you, you didn't, you didn't come out and say it, but it's, they're not there to really feed us. They're there to make money off of us. So that's their primary focus. So on in their, in their departments, mm -hmm. they have people who are like, they're not nutritional psychologists, but they kind of are, they're trying to figure out, they're trying to figure out the psychology of how a person's brain works so that they can get to, convince us to get more of their product <laughs> to create so, cravings. So, yes. So to make them like, hyper palatable. Yeah. Yes. And so you're like the, the white knight on the other side of that <laughs> equation, fighting the good fight for us, protecting us by helping us understand the psychology of why these yeah. foods 
do this to our brain and then yeah. how we can choose something that's nourishing for us yeah. and maybe a better choice for us. Not saying we can never have those foods just to under- right. we understand the consequences. It's a lot that be- it's a lot easier to make a decision about your choice when you know what the consequences yeah. will be. Well, thank you for saying that. I, I, I personally feel that you're absolutely right. Food manufacturers are there to make money. They are there to make money uh, by the choices we make. And we make a choice every single day by where we spend our dollars. And we can buy more produce or we can hang out in the packaged food section and buy lots and lots of foods that are either frozen foods, the one frozen food you should buy, or the two are frozen berries or frozen fruit without added sugar, syrup, or salt, or you know, actual frozen veggies, great alternative. Um, and by the way, Middle Isle does have some healthy alternatives for us, like dried beans, dried lentils, great choices, canned tuna, canned, actually not my favorite, I should have said canned salmon, anchovies and sardines, because they're rich in omega-3s if you consume seeds. Food. So there are some purposes that we should be being should be walking through the center aisles, but the problem is that, you know, when we read a food label, and we say, oh, this is high in vitamin X, this is high in um, wheat. I had an example of a, a, a young mother who was was coming to see me for for these sessions, and she brought in her little daughter. Very proudly said, her daughter was little and was kind of eating her cereal while we were talking. And she said, Dr. Now, you'll be so proud of me. I got her the whole wheat cereal because you told me whole grains are really important. And in fact, I did. And I said to her, I, I felt really bad. And I said, you know what? Let's just look up the cereal. Let's just look it up together online. Tell me which one you bought. And we looked at it. And the, the last, you know, it wasn't, there was very little whole grain in it because they're actually things, there's a whole wheat council, a whole grains council, and they have actual little labels which tell you the amount of grain, actual grain, had a ton of sugar, virtually no fiber in it, and a lot of fortified, you know, vitamins, and she'd been, unfortunately, she'd been duped. I felt really badly, because this was an expensive box of cereal, you know, for a mom that was, 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 you know, was trying, trying to do right by her children, buying healthy foods. And it's a great example of, you know, how the consumer gets duped into thinking they're buying something healthy for their child. And, you know, the food labels are not there um, to help us. We need to be savvy and learn how to interpret them so that we buy the best choices. Whether Look, we can't avoid packaged and processed foods, but buy the best versions of those if we can. And the one way you can know that is by reading that label. Absolutely. And you're looking for one thing I I'll say what I look for and you can give me some more tips. So one of the things yeah. I always look for is I look for the total sugars, but then I also look mm. for added, added sugars underneath that yes. because if, mm-hmm. because some foods naturally have natural sugars in them yes. and that's mm-hmm. not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but then if they've, it's then if they've added a lot of sugar, sugar. to the product, yeah. That's where I want to pay attention. And I love that you brought up fruited yogurt earlier because yogurt is one that I'm always going on about with my audience because I think there's, you have this, like you have a million yogurt choices in any yeah. grocery store you go to. And it's almost impossible to find a whole, like a whole fat, full fat, for instance, I don't want, because yeah. once they take the fat out, they have to put something in to make it taste good. So what <laughs> yes. do they normally put in? sugar. Right. And so it's very hard to find like, anyway, but when, when I read it, so when I look, I look for what it it, does it have added sugar. I often will also check the Mm -hmm. sodium and some foods naturally are naturally higher in sodium, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. I, you know, you were talking about, uh, processed meats, like the bacon or the nitrate free bacon. Mm-hmm. And even those mm-hmm. very, very high in sodium. And when you think about mm-hmm. how many servings of that, they'll, they'll do the tricky thing too, where they're like, Oh, a serving is this teaspoon of this thing or like one <laughs> yes. strip. And you're like, yes, 860 Who milligrams. <laughs> Who eats one serve? Like you're going to eat like right. four <laughs> servings. So then you're going to have like right. 2000 milligrams of sodium. Right. So right. yeah. So speak, speak to That's us great. about what else. <laughs> yes. Should we yes. Look for? So, so, you know, you're absolutely right about serving size is hugely important. Always look at that because sometimes you think, oh, this is just 40 calories. It's great. But actually the serving size literally is a teaspoon. 
or an ounce or two ounces. Um, and 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 I, I actually interpret, by the way, I should, this is an important point. I interpret it back to ounces because our recipes in this country are, sta are standardized to pounds and ounces, but our food labels are in grams. And wouldn't you know, that confuses everyone because we don't cook in grams, right? That's not our system. So for example, four grams of sugar is one teaspoon. And by knowing that people can quickly convert uh, the number of grams in a yogurt or anything else that you're eating into grams of sugar, then added sugar is hugely important. Sodium, important. Fiber, very important because the Americans spend a lot of time worrying about protein, but if you're eating a healthy diet and you're using say clean protein powder to supplement that as well, it's actually fiber that we're lacking because Americans just don't eat enough vegetables and beans, nuts, seeds, legumes, whole grains, um, and you know, fruit. Because all of these contain fiber. You can't get fiber from animal and seafood protein. So those are things we should be leaning into. Fiber grams are important. I do, I, I'm less of a calorie counter, but I do ask people to pay attention to portion size. The the size of the American dinner plate grew in the last 60 to 100 years from about eight to nine inches in diameter to about 11 to 12 inches in diameter. So in fact, when we have larger plates, what happens? We, you know, we feel badly if it, there isn't food in it. So we, we eat more food over time. And these are things that have just not helped us. Um, protein grams are important. So important to know that you're getting your protein. I'm not saying ignore that. And um, I am not as worried anymore about the number of grams of fat. And I'll tell you why. You know, the thinking around saturated fats was really revised, but not all practitioners or clinicians believe it. Um, you know, it, it really looked at the studies around saturated fat. And having having a, a clean, uh, uh, a grass-fed piece of beef, you know, a few times a week or however often you eat it, I'm not saying eat it every day, is not the worst option for you anymore. It's not, you know, what we used to think, um, but not everyone's on board with that. So I, I say, look at the fat, but, but there's a lot of mixed versions of what the healthy fats are. So lean into rather, you know, your omega-3 fats, your olive oil, your avocado, and things like that. And I wouldn't be worried as much about that argument around saturated fats. Um, the, the fats that are bad for us are hydrogenated, the trans fats, things that you find in, you know, packaged baked goods, the, um, you know, the, the, the cakes that are packaged and you, know, you, um, uh, you buy them on the, on the supermarket shelf and they, they last a little while, that type of thing. So it's just, I think understanding those things becomes important and really being an advocate for your own, your own uh, mental well-being. Yes, a hundred percent. And and there's something to be said about the process of nourishing yourself. We talked about nourishing our gut bacteria and how that they support our brain. And then there's this, you know, like you have this wonderful breakdown in your book about like, you know, let's go to the grocery store. Let's prepare the foods for ourselves. Let's cook. And I'm a mm -hmm. huge advocate for doing some cooking for yourself as well. We mm -hmm. all understand that people have busy lives. They can't, maybe they can't cook mm -hmm. every night. Um, mm -hmm. I like to promote like a few different options for people who are busy. I love batch cooking. I personally, on the weekend, mm -hmm. I am lucky enough to have a day or two off on the weekend. And I mm -hmm. like to go buy grocery. I'll make a plan of what recipes I'm going to make. Mm -hmm. I like to prepare quite a bit of my food over the weekend. Cause then I can slow cook things. I can prepare. Mm -hmm. I can, I have time to chop my veggies. I have time right. to let the, let my, cr let myself cry from chopping all the onions and, you know, like experiment with the garlic, but there yes. is a lot yeah. to be said for cooking for yourself more and, and how important yeah. and, and, and self what a self-loving act it is and, and wonderful to be able to cook for ourselves. I feel like we need to get back to that practice or to move in that direction as much as we can, I think. I, I agree with you. And I feel like, you know, part of the reason I wrote that chapter was because I wanted people um, 
to feel comfortable, even if they make simple things. It doesn't have to be a souffle. You know, I, um, I, because I came from a, from a, a wonderful family, but, but also full of wonderful cooks, I actually didn't cook until I was older. And uh, I had to move away from them because they were always fresh meals prepared by, you know, my mom, my grandmother, my aunts, my older cousins. Um, and I, I always in, was in the kitchen. So I learned a lot by, by observation and being around. But it, it can be very intimidating for some people. And I think Absolutely. to your point, Bri, it's such a self-nourishing act of self-love just to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to make sure that I have meals for breakfast whether you live alone or you have a big family, um, whatever your situation, it is taking care of yourself. And sometimes, you know, I, I'll tell you on weeks that I don't have time for that meal prep day or that batch cooking day, I feel very off. You know, I, I there were weeks this past month when I was traveling and I had not forgotten on one day um, I was running late. I had not packed my snacks for the airport and I was hungry. You know, and the best I could do is get a very expensive banana. But at least I was like, okay, well, I'll, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I, I like bananas. But, but you know, it was I had forgotten my snacks. And, and a lot of the nuts and things at the airport, not all of them were just clean nuts. They had a lot of stuff in them. So I think it's such an important thing just to spend that little bit of time with ourselves. I think cooking can be a very mindful um, practice. It can be a very healing practice. It can be very nurturing, um, but not everyone likes it. And and for those of you who are listening and don't like, don't yet like cooking, um, you know, maybe find your way, find your way in because it's a way to really just look after yourself. And um, and I, I guarantee, I guarantee you'll start to feel better. Yeah, and and I think you know for. I have many, many people who follow me who have a household and I, I always like, oh, yeah. you know, I don't, I, I live alone and I, that works well for me, but I've, I've heard from many of the women who I talk to that getting their family involved in the food prep and like modeling that to their kids is a great way to get them to, yes. to learn and also to get some help to have your little sous chefs be, be there to, yes. to support you. That's, and that's actually, that's actually what I talk about as well. That's exactly it. One way, and I really appreciate you said that one way to bring kids and younger ones into the fold of cooking and healthier eating is have them be part of that experience, whether it's buying different colors of foods in the supermarket. And by that, I don't mean Skittles, you know, I mean all those different colored veggies and, um, and berries and things like that, but bring them into it and help them uh, do simple tasks in the kitchen so that they feel a part of it and they start to experience food, uh, the touch, feel, flavor, um, you know, little tasks that are safe for them to do. It, it's so important to do that. This isn't something that you talk much about in your book, but because I, I live alone and my family is my dog, um, I noticed <laughs> I've always paid a lot of attention to what I feed him because I, mm -hmm. I want him to be really healthy. And in the last couple of years, I had switched over to a, a brand of food that's like, a, it, it comes frozen, but it's a, it's a, it's like, I I've eaten it before. It's like a stew. It's like a pre-cooked food. And I have never seen him have better energy, better fur, more healthy poops. Like he is just, he's just so healthy and happy on this, like yeah. really good, real food. And yeah. I think that is something that you, you know, I don't know how much you talk about pet health and brain health, but, but I, I can't you know, imagine that it wouldn't correlate. Like it has to be connected. It's, it's a, it's an area of great interest to me because I hear this all the time. I see it. I, I, I'm unfortunately wish I could have a pet. I had, I had pets growing up, but um, my schedule right now does not permit uh, to permit that, but I feel it's so connected to how their health is, um, how they feel, how a, a pup or a, even a dog or cat can be super anxious and antsy. And I'll, I'll, you know, my clients will even tell me this. And cleaning up, I think, their diet and just going for those healthier options. And I even had a client who, as part of her experience of really getting to know nurture herself and move her own mental well-being in the right direction, what she would do is she would just flavor it differently. 
but she would cook the same meal for herself and her pets. So her, her thing in her meal prep was she ate chicken as one of the things. She liked a lot of different types of poultry and she would spend that extra money on getting good quality, but she would make the same thing for her pet. And she actually told me how they, the, the two dogs were starting to really thrive with this diet. Now they weren't, they didn't have behavioral problems, but like you said, they were starting to look healthier. They were more relaxed. They were more fit. Um, she noticed their fur changed. So I think it's, I really do feel there's a lot there uh, to pay attention to. And for those of you listening who have kids, I mean, I hear a lot from women who are like, my kids are picky eaters. And I, I get that. And like some adults too, are very picky eaters. And, um, and I think there's, there's a lot of legitimacy when it comes to, it's not always that the person is picky. Sometimes they have a textural issue with certain foods, or there's some association from childhood with a food that they were forced to eat because it was healthy. Yeah. And I, yeah. so I, I feel that there's, I have a lot of empathy for that. Um, what, what do you say to picky eaters or how do you help people with those questions? I think that's a tough one. Uh, I really do. And I, I use a few different approaches. One is what I shared, which is bring them into the experience and see, yeah. work with what they're willing to eat. But again, you know, it can be hard because the child may only want to eat frozen pizza or only want to eat the Skittles. And how, how do you get around that? So I totally, I totally acknowledge that this is not an easy question. One of the things that I do help, uh, help families think about is how can you take a healthy food and put it into something they're eating? So, you know, adding, um, you know, if, they, if they're big French fry fans, can you take, um, you know, can you make carrot fries, zucchini fries and, and use an air fryer? So it's a healthier version and spice them up and make them flavorful. Can you um, make, add berries and spinach and make a monster smoothie? You know, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a weird color that a child may appeal to a child, but actually it includes largely healthy ingredients from them. I wouldn't depend on the smoothie every single day, but I would give that to them as an option. Um, are there ways you can make your uh, meatballs? And if you, you know, plant-based, you can make lentil, uh, make the same thing with lentils. But can you add like, you know, cauliflower is pretty insidious, you know, you can flavor it up and you can use frozen cauliflower and uh, stack these meatballs with them and be adding a lot more fiber and vegetables same thing with things like spinach. Uh, but you have to be careful with kids because if they see a color they don't like, they may not eat it. So you might want to think, you know, what their particular thing is and then work with it. Uh, kids usually, usually love, you know, meatballs and sauce. So so that's an easy one because tomatoes can be super healthy with the lycopene. Um, you can use, you know, whatever your sauce of protein is and stack a lot of veggies inside that they don't realize. So it's almost you kind of have to be a little bit of a detective by adding in things that are healthy for them if they're going to immediately oppose it and trying to think of something they like and then make a healthy version, like the ice cream we talked about or the, or the fries or the crunchy snack um, and, and, and work, work, work your way from there. I love how you talked about, I love what you said about the monster smoothie. And that made me think of a lot of what, appeals to kids. And you gave so many great examples. Another way to think about this is the way that we use language with kids about food. Yes. So yes. calling something a monster smoothie could be very appealing to some right. kids, right? But also talking about, I guess, I feel like kids are very smart and they pick up so mm -hmm. much from us. And, and I feel like, I wonder if talking a little bit more, like getting kids involved in the cooking, but also because understanding like our food, we made the food. Now we get, now we get to eat it, Yes, but yes. also like we also, so there's a sense of accomplishment in this thing yes. that we created together, but also like, oh, we're including this chicken because chicken includes protein, which makes us strong. Or we include right. these lentils because they have all this fiber and protein and those two things. Right you know, all of the, we just talk about like some of the benefits and just yes. casually talking about that stuff. Like why we ourselves are eating those things can be really impactful. I think for children, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. if we only get the message that we have to eat what's on our plate, then we kind of rebel because that's the natural. It's rebel. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not something that parents have used over time. I know a very, um, I met a company 
that was producing really cool cartoon videos for kids to teach them to eat things like broccoli, but making the broccoli kind of funny and interesting that had interesting names like the, you know, some of the antioxidants involved. And I thought that was so smart because, you know, it's a way to teach the healthy, exactly what you're saying, teach the healthy nutrient from food and tap into whether they want to be strong or they want to be more healthy or they want to be taller you know what whatever, whatever it is that appeals i think we we just have to you know kids are very smart and we have to as the adults or the parents just try to figure out ways to outsmart them for their better brain health as i like to think about it you know we're not we're not being deceptive we just we just try to outsmart them so that they eat healthy for their brain because we do know that the brain health of children is hugely important it's especially important now because in teens um you know, children and teens and, and adolescents, the second most common cause of death is suicide, and they are really suffering. They're just really suffering, as are many people, but it's uh, food is a very big factor in their level of focus, attention, energy, functioning. Um, and I just think it's something that we can help help them with um, by guiding them. It's not easy, but but finding a way in is important. You're so, you're so right. So spot on. And I, I was just thinking as you were talking about that, how the adults out there who are picky eaters, um, that mm-hmm. all of these things that we just talked about are great things to do for yourself or for a picky eater sure. adult in your own life. And to think about the fact that why as an adult, you may be a picky eater may come in some part from how you were treated as a child or how food was presented to you or the associations that you may have had with food as a child. And that if you can sort of heal that process, or you can find these fun ways to work with yourself in that process where Mm -hmm. you can find like, this is a food I don't always like, but I'm going to learn more about the benefits Mm -hmm. that it has to Mm -hmm. my body. And that might be a reason to incorporate it into a new dish where you can't really taste Mm -hmm. it very much, but you get the benefits. So you start to overcome your aversion to the food mm-hmm. and create a new association. These are just ideas, right? Or personifying a food. Like I love, I, I think those cartoons could work for adults too. <laughs> I, I totally agree. And, and, and I, I, I think they frankly should be shared with adults as well, but, but exa- that's exactly right. I mean, I think that at any age, you might find some of the struggles to eat, you know, the avocado or the broccoli, or they, they don't, like a flavor of something and I think these apply and I feel I feel that there's so many things that you know we might be doing for children that we could be doing for ourselves and the easier that we make it on a family you said your audience has a lot of families and and you know the what you're doing for your kids you can be doing for yourselves there are adult versions or spices can change up a certain food but it makes it easy because you're still prepping one thing and you're just using it in a slightly different way, but it's it's a way that we can get the get the task done. Yeah, absolutely. And then not to discount the fact that there are, of course, always going to be like likes and dislikes, personal preferences that you may have. For me, for instance, I don't do well with spicy peppers. I love yeah some types of spice like wasabi. I really like that as a spice. I really like ginger and garlic, but when it comes to like hot peppers, I'm a big baby. I can only do mild. (laughs) So I steer more in that direction just because that tends to be like my preference, but that doesn't mean I can't still enjoy other foods. There's, there's so many different foods out there. And I guess I really encourage everyone to get a copy of Dr. Naidu's book um, and, and get a chance to, to read over all of these different, there's all of these different foods for all of these different moods and, and, and situations that people find themselves in and how you can really heal your body just by intentionally incorporating foods into the food you're already eating. You're already eating multiple times a day, just adding in a couple things here and there just to intentionally support yourself, right? I think that's your, that's very much your approach. How can I intentionally support myself? It, it is, it's, you know, it's kind of, what can I clean up a little bit and what can I enhance and what can I add to my plate? That's really important for my brain. Make it as simple as possible. I think there's too much of elimination and exclusion of food and diet dilemmas and food wars going on. So I'm not saying I have to tell you what to eat, but I am saying whatever it is you eat, whatever pattern of food that you're following, just make the best choices and add more to your plate 
uh, because you can add tons of veggies to your plate and be very satisfied with that and still have your clean protein or your seafood, whatever else you're eating. It's about leaning into the things that help our brain health um, and enhance that than, than anything else. So yeah, that, that, that is it. <laughs> that is it in a nutshell. Well, I, um, I'm excited for everyone to, to follow up with you and, uh, and read the book. And of course your wonderful website is a great hub for everything that you have to offer. It's umanaidumd.com. And, um, you can find a link to, um, this really great, uh, nutrition and mental health course from that yes. it's a continuing education course, right? It's an edu and anyone yes. can do this to do this course. Um, uh, I, I was taking a look at it. Is that correct? Or do you have to have been? So there are two, sure. So there are two courses that um, I've, I've actually released. One is at Mass General Hospital, and that is mostly clinician based. Although anyone can take it if you're looking for credits for uh, say licensing for being a nurse or a physician or something like that, you can get those credits. If you're just wanting to learn, you can get a certificate of completion. And I also have my own course, which I developed because I received so much interest in how can I learn and do more, even for my own family and my own health. Um, and that we are releasing in the summer. So stay tuned right. to my website and to my social media at Dr. Uman I do, which is uh, dr at D-R-U-M-A-N-A-I-D-O-O -O, and you'll hear more about it there. So thank you. I'm, I'm excited to share that with more people. Yes, I'm so excited for them to have access to those resources. I look forward to checking out all of it myself. And uh, no matter when you're listening to this, to this episode with us, uh, we hope that you connect with us again, leave us any questions or comments and follow up uh, with with your questions and, and keep taking good care of your health, all of you out there. Um, Dr. Naidu, thank you again so much for your time and energy and sharing with us. And um, great to have you on. Thank you, Brie. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. It's such great questions. I, I look forward to us keeping in touch. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Brie Argett Singer, Betty Rocker Inc. and the producers disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. Before starting a new exercise, fitness or health protocol, or if you think you have a medical problem, always consult a licensed physician.